Declaration, all of which ratified what Lincoln had already done. Same thing happened in March 1933, wasn't it? Roosevelt made his declaration of a national emergency and had the banking crisis and all these other executive orders. He changed the Trading with the Enemy Act to make us all enemies, you see? Belligerents under international law and municipal law and all these kind of good things. And while Congress was out of session, as soon as Congress came back in session, what did Congress do? They ratified them all. Usually within all, all, almost all, except for one, and I can't remember which one it was, were ratified within 48 hours. And there was a lot of protests at that time in various isolated places that, you know, I don't even get a chance to read the bills and I get passed. You know, a lot of complaints of that regard. The point was, is that once FDR had done what he did, he became the last of the unholy trinity, which included Abraham, uh, which included not just A. Lincoln, but also Tom Jefferson, who was the first to bring international law into the District of Columbia when he initiated a campaign in Congress to pass and approve the laws of war, which automatically invokes international and municipal law within the District of Columbia when there's a national emergency of some kind. Now the question becomes, how do we know when we're under a national emergency? When the president decides there's one, no one else has anything to say about it. Not the courts, not the Congress, not the Justice Department, not the FBI, nobody. Example, the banking crisis that was created, or excuse me, <laughs> wasn't created, that was allowed, no, that's not right either, uh, that just happened in uh, 1931 and 32. Now this banking crisis, there's not a whole lot of information about it out there because it kind of smells when you start adding up the numbers. Basically what happened was is the banks in the United States were taking in gold coin, $20 gold pieces, you see, and issuing back for them gold certificates, which at the time nobody minded. Gold was at 21, 22, sometimes as high as 20, 20 2210, 2220 an ounce, etc., but it always dropped back. What the American people didn't know was that the bankers were taking in the gold at $21 to $22 an ounce and then reselling it overseas at $34 an ounce. But what most Americans don't know is the gold never left the country. Not one bar, not one coin left the country. Why? Because it was all in the banks bank vault in New York City and they had some a whole series of rather large bank vaults created during that period of time and uh, they were very very large concrete reinforced steel and everything else with all kinds of security measures done up on them and basically they duplicated what already existed at Fort Knox and then what they did on the floor they painted a checkerboard on the floor and each square was a different color and you'd walk into this vault and you'd see pallets of gold bars sitting on these different colored squares. And any time there was a change in the balance of payment, the little guy would come in in his little forklift and pick up a forklift full of gold bars and go over and move it on another colored square. And that's how they settled the balance of payments. But the gold never left the United States. Well, yeah, but all the gold went to England. We all know that. Well, it didn't. Sorry, but... Before Land Lease, does anybody remember what the size of the uh, sale of U.S. arms and material and everything else was to England? Rank, ran into several billion dollars, and Roosevelt's price for making that sale was that England, through Mr. Churchill, pay in gold. The next time England placed an order for materials, and Roosevelt demanded gold, Churchill says, you got it all last time. And thus Lend-Lease was created, in which they lent the, the materials and everything else to England to continue the war with a lease that began as soon as the war terminated. Now, nothing particularly significant about that, except that the lease demanded payments in gold. Now, you really start thinking about this kind of stuff, and it makes perfect sense that all the gold would be here. Because every time you turn around, there's a war in Europe, or in Asia, or in Africa, 
are, and the governments in South America are constantly rising and falling and rising and falling, and thus the only place where there was a country that had a modicum of safety was the United States. And that's why all the gold came over here. And we have it all now. Most, most of the major gold in Europe and England came here. Now, what it comes down to, the bottom line is this, that in these military courts, you're dealing with courts that, as I said before, sit in summary court-martial proceedings against civilians. Now, summary court-martials are, can be kind of bloody unless you know what's going on. What's the very first piece of process that any court, including a military court, must issue before an action can be begun? I didn't say joined, all right? Because there's several steps, at least in common law, before a plaintiff and a defendant, who isn't a defendant until joined, there are several steps in the common law that one must go through, assuming we had lawful courts, before there is a case that can be brought inside the bar. You know what the bar is? It's that little, uh, you know, fence with the swinging gate and everything else that divides the gallery from the main part of the court. All right. Until a case, a case cannot be brought in bar until the plaintiff and defendant are properly joined after going through the intermediate steps in lawful courts. The intermediate steps include, in this order, abatement, demur, joinder, rejoinder, rebutter, and surabutter, all right? And the object of all that paperwork, flying back and forth between plaintiff and respondent or defendant, is to narrow the issues, get rid of all the extraneous stuff, and bring it down just to the bottom line, and that's the issue we go to court with. That's why common law cases were usually very simple and also very short, seldom lasting more than a week or so at the outside usually over within a matter of three or four hours because both the issues in the case were clearly defined and thus when guilt or innocence was determined the outcome of the case could be clearly and quickly determined now what did i say was the very first piece of process that one issues anytime you get paperwork from anybody who looks like they're trying to sue you or take your property. The very first one you issue is an abatement. Assuming there are errors in the plaintiff's paperwork. You see, the idea of the abatement, all right, is to give the plaintiff a better suit. You file it to correct errors in the plaintiff's process. And if the plaintiff cannot correct those errors, the plaintiff cannot bring a case. But you must file, excuse me, sir, and if I ever say file an abatement, I want you guys to remind me what I said, okay? Because you never file an abatement in court. You never file a default in court. You always serve them on the parties, all right? Now, having said that, if I say filed any time, I want to hear it from you, okay? Because I do slip every now and then. I've been spending so much time in bar, I've forgotten how to fight, fight a case out of bar, all right? But the bottom line is, does a military court or a defendant who brings process in a military court have lawful process? What is the law of such courts? during peacetime? Well, if you go through the sources, it's international and municipal law. All right? You look at international law, it's got some cute little things in it, you know. As long as there's full disclosure of everything that's going on, why well, you can't accuse anyone of fraud under international law. And that's why we, I, uh, I don't join conspiracy movements because everything I need to know about what the government has done to us and why they've done it is a matter of public record. It must be that way or you can bring fraud against anyone and make it stick in the United States government. But under international law, you have things like deceit is legal. You're a belligerent, you're an enemy. I'm the United States government, you're my enemy. I have the right to use deceit in order to deceive you and win.